Okay, Jacob, we are now live. Okay, thanks, Edwin. Um, and thanks to everyone for joining us in this course development prize in architecture, climate change, and society special session. Um, all attendees are muted. Please, if you join any other uh, sessions so far, this will be familiar, but please use the question and answer feature to submit questions and vote on them um, for the discussion that will follow the presentations. Conference registrants will have access to a recording of this session on the platform and on the Buell Center uh, project website in the next month, um, which will allow you to see presentations you might have missed uh, or enjoyed and would like to watch again. Links and access to these recorded presentations will be available in the platform uh, the following day, so hopefully by Monday. Um, so thanks again. I'm Jacob Moore. I'm the Associate Director of the Temple Hoyne Buell Center for the Study of American Architecture at um, Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation. Um, we have just an hour today for this special session on the Course Development Prize that we've, uh, this is the second year that we've sponsored together with the ACSA, so I'm going to try and keep this very brief. Um, let's see, quickly before starting, though today we are dispersed virtually, I'm joining you from Lenape Hoking, the unceded ancestral homeland of the Lenape peoples, whose violent dispossession was central to the colonial establishment and growth in New York City, and whose knowledge was excluded from the founding canons of our shared disciplines. Um, concurrently, I'm joining you from an institution where the graduate workers of Columbia, UAW, are on strike regarding the terms of their first union contract. We at the Buell Center strongly support these workers and their efforts. Um, speaking personally, I see making visible the connections between such seemingly distant, distinct struggles and the institutions, practices, and forms of the built environment that participate in them as a key professional responsibility directed toward facilitating much needed change therein. So, as I mentioned, um, it's very quick. So, all of the information I think you will want um, about the basics of the prize you can find on a few different websites that I'm going to just drop into the chat now. Um, this is the Buell Center where I work um, and that has sponsored the course development prize with the ACSA for, this is the second annual um, edition um, that we're celebrating today with the winners. Um, that is the ACSA's page for it. Here's the Buell Center's page for it, which mirrors the information. But through this page, you can see we had a have a multi-year project going that sort of forms a context for this um, prize on our end called Power Infrastructure in America that has lots of moving parts. I would encourage you to peruse the site. Um, just can't resist to plug a couple projects that I think might be of special interest that are recently released or um, ongoing at the Buell Center as part of this power thing. One is um, called the A&E System, which is an online publication we released um, just uh, a couple months back um, that I think will hopefully be gaining some relevance traction as infrastructure really uh, gains steam in the halls of Congress as the next giant legislative push. And this other project called Green Reconstruction, which I'll just let you read about on your own if you're interested. So um, I have spoken with all the presenters. We are really excited to celebrate with them. There are many from five institutions. I'm not going to give you all of their bios. Um, but you can look them up via the ACSA uh, platform um, or, or on their own institutions. Um, and we're going to have recorded presentations followed by a Q&A. So I'm just going to hand it off to um, Edwin of the ACSA who's going to run us through their presentations. And then we'll circle back together for a conversation before, before concluding. So um, take it away, Edwin. Gulf, Architecture, Ecology, and Precarity on the Gulf Coast. Much of contemporary carbon culture and its environmental consequences can be traced back forensically or circumstantially to the U.S. Gulf Coast. 
The extraction of fossil fuels has made the Texas-Louisiana coastline a global center of oil and gas production, sprawling along the bayous and wetlands of Beaumont, Galveston, Baton Rouge, Lake Charles, and Houston. While the products of, of carbon have fueled the mega region's expansion, the sprawling oil and gas industry has produced structural inequities in its built environment. Racially segregated fence line communities sit in uneasy proximity to petrochemical plants subject to the environmental impacts of polluted soil, air, groundwater, and aquifers. Toxic clouds, spills, plumes, and other disasters are common in these areas particularly during the extreme weather events exacerbated by climate change. Further, the petrochemical industry has shaped the Gulf Coast's car culture, sprawling infrastructure, and ad hoc urbanism. Asphalt and concrete dominate the landscape. In this context, an examination of the relationship between architecture, urbanism, climate, precarity, and environmental justice is, is urgently de needed. The critical archaeology of petroculture centered on Houston is fundamental to the pursuit of environmental justice for the communities of the Gulf megaregion, as well as to speculation on the current climate crisis at large. Gulf proposes a super studio, a combined year-long research studio and seminar that will undertake a comprehensive engagement with issues of urbanism and ecology in the region. We will examine both its past and its potential futures, applying the tools of material and environmental history, ethnography, critical theory, and design. In the process, we will research strategies for tackling the Gulf Coast's wicked problems with the aim of healing the discriminatory effects of petroculture on these communities and on the broader environment of the Gulf. This year-long research project will take place through paired courses held at the University of Houston College of Architecture and Design. A research studio titled Gulf Urbanism After Carbon, combined with a research seminar titled Petrocultures, Justice Environment Architecture. These interdisciplinary courses will be conducted in collaboration with local organizations whose work focuses on environmental justice, pollution, and air quality. The courses will involve travel and field research to study impacted areas throughout the Gulf Coast in collaboration with partner institutions with direct connections to these communities. Our possible sites for this research will include Baton Rouge in Louisiana's Cancer, Cancer Alley, Lake Jackson in Texas, also known as Dowtown, and Harrisburg, Manchester, a fence line community surrounded by oil infrastructure along the Houston Ship, Ship Channel. The Gulf Super Studio takes as its premise that petroculture has configured the contemporary urban landscape or petroscape of the Gulf Coast megaregion at every scale through infrastructure, energy, and transportation. As our energy systems evolve toward more sustainable models, the embedded landscapes of a century plus of oil dependence will have to be reused, removed, or remade in the development of the post-petropolis, an ecological zero-carbon urbanism. In our research, we will model scenarios for how these energy transitions might occur and examine how such futures can create greater equity for communities that have been disproportionately subject to the toxic effects of carbon culture. We will explore interdisciplinary frameworks through which to approach the cultural, historical, and climatic stakes of petroculture. Our research will draw from the fields of environmental and material history, climate futures, cultural and critical theory, the philosophy of science and technology, technology and the history of architecture and urbanism. The proposed super studio format of a combined year-long studio and seminar is an entirely new pedagogical model at the University of Houston. It furthers the college's ambition to run studios with an interdisciplinary focus on climate architecture, landscape, and society. We aim to provide a comprehensive engagement with Gulf Coast architecture as it touches on climate, issues of climate, urban planning, and environmental justice. The studio will, and seminar will ask and attempt to answer fundamental questions. For instance, as energy transitions, what happens to the many precarious communities impacted by the petrochemical industry? How do we repair the historical effects of a century and a half of heavy industry on the climate and built environment? And how do we maintain the quickly disappearing legacy of Gulf Coast architecture in a place that tears everything down? 
In this sense, the Gulf Super Studio deals with both pre and post, with the history as well as the speculative futures of petrochemicals long century and its aftermath. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dr. Reginald Ellis, Associate Professor of History and Assistant Dean in the School of Graduate Studies, Research and Continuing Education at Florida a &M University here in Tallahassee, Florida. I'm excited to be a part of the History of African American Land Ownership course as the historian for this course. Our first lecture will look at uh, the migratory patterns after the Great Migration and how African Americans moving into other areas change living patterns and land ownership opportunities and also the adverse impacts of that movement. We will also the build off of that with our second lecture from that with a discussion of the Philadelphia Negro uh, as written by W.E.B. Du Bois. Philadelphia at the time was one of the most wealthy cities in the United States of America. However, the Ninth Ward was one of the poorest. And so we will look at those, the living standards that was going on in Philadelphia's Ninth Ward in 1897. The next lecture will be presented by Edward Ayers, Southern Crossing and how the railroads ushered uh, ushered segregation into the American South uh, from 1877 to 1906. Not only did the railroads usher in segregation, it also changed living patterns. It changed the way individuals, uh, blacks and whites, lived together in the rural American South. So this conversation will build upon the first three lectures. Our final lecture will be a discussion of how uh, there was a town and gown relationship created from the Florida a University History Department and the city of Tallahassee and how those individuals worked together to revitalize a section of the historic black neighborhood, the Allen subdivision, by making sure that individuals' memories were included into that project. We look forward to being a part of this project and excited to answer any questions. Thank you. The second part of the course surveys contemporary planning and its intersection with black communities. Students will be introduced to the use of zoning laws, redlining, restrictive covenants, the role of highways, train tracks, and barricades. While railroads connected American cities, they also created segregated neighborhoods as shown in Hartford, Connecticut. In Florida, the East Coast Railway runs north-south and defines who does and does not belong on the beach. Railroads divided and arenas erased. The city of Atlanta decimated its black neighborhoods to create the original Brave Stadium and then Turner Field. The neighborhoods were sacrificed again for the development of the Civic Center and the Falcon Stadium. After America's railroads were built, racial division was further accentuated through the funding and construction of interstate highways. In Shreveport, Louisiana, it was the building of the imposing Interstate 49. In Charleston, West Virginia, Interstate 64 and 77 run through what was known as the Triangle Neighborhood. In Florida, the victims are named Overtown, Sistrunk, La Villa, Paramore, and Eatonville. In Jackson Ward, the story was much the same. The business community was known as the Black Wall Street and it earned the nickname the Harlem of the South. But eventually, Jackson Ward was chosen as a path for I-95 construction. In Kansas City, a local road, Troost Avenue, bisects the city. In St. Louis, it's the four-lane Del Mar Boulevard. In Detroit, Eight Mile Road is the line between Detroit and its northern suburbs. In D.C., State Road 40 was a key part of a proposed east-west freeway. The incomplete project upended hundreds of lives, transformed an entire landscape, and cost tens of millions. Locals call it the road to nowhere. In 1962, an Atlanta surgeon purchased a house in a white neighborhood. In response, the mayor constructed a barricade nicknamed Atlanta's Berlin Wall. 
It was removed a year later, but other walls remain. In North Miami, a wall was built between the white Buena Vista and the Black Lemon City neighborhoods. The wall remains. In Pompano Beach, the wall was built to separate the white Kendall Lake neighborhood from its black neighbors. The wall remains. In Lake Worth, the black neighborhood of Osborne has only one through street. The community is boxed in with a wall to the west, a county dump to the south, and a railroad track to the east. Today, the wall remains. Newcomers to Atlanta quickly learned that there are many streets named Peachtree, and the street names often shift and change, especially at Ponce de Leon Avenue. At Ponce, the changing street names define the space and boundaries of black and white Atlanta. And this one, we are currently um, on the stream. Okay, so I think you would have my voice. I apologize. I'm not sure why we are losing the audio on my section. And I'm going to summarize because it's time that most of it is gone. But the last part basically was focusing on um, the architectural elements that are learned from nature, such as oak trees that last hurricanes or oyster reefs. And it's basically talking about flooding, amphibious structures, and other precedents uh, that are done in Venice or um, places like in Maldives, um, such as a project done by the um, MIT um, lab. And then the last slide was just talking about an uh, interdisciplinary project that the students could analyze um, the whole thing they learned from the historical approach towards the analyzing of the roads and then finding out solutions to mitigate for both hurricane and flooding in Tallahassee and St. and North um, and St. Port Joe. So that would be uh, concluding our part on the project that the student would reflect on how they are connecting the history to um, flooding issues and then architectural elements to mitigate for them.
Good afternoon, my name is Liz McCormick and I'm an assistant professor at UNC Charlotte and I'm here to share my proposal, High Performance Low Tech, which is a building technology elective that hopefully we'll be offering uh, next spring. So first I'd like to tell you why I think this class is important. In understanding climate, annual mean temperatures are generally correlated with latitudes closest to the equator. And we tend to think of tropical regions as those between the tropics, the Tropic of Capricorn and the Tropic of Cancer. However, there's, there's really a lot of nuance when it comes to the climate in these regions. Hydrothermal regions can be more specific to precipitation and local conditions of the microclimate. So even though temperatures are higher closer to the equator in both hemispheres, these regions are split between hot humid, such as in Southeast Asia, and hot arid, such as Northern Africa. So when we're talking about tropical and subtropical climates, these are really the regions that we're talking about according to the koppen geiger climate classification. Uh, so why is this important? The United Nations has identified that nine of the top 10 uh, urbanizing regions, most rapidly urbanizing regions, reside within the geographic tropics, a portion of the world that has historically lagged in wealth and resources. But if you look at the countries in pink, which are high income economies defined by the World Bank, you don't see a lot of wealth in the tropics. In fact, only four major tropical economies, Hong Kong, uh, Singapore, Saudi Arabia, and Venezuela are, are categorized as uh, high income economies, again, as defined by the World Bank. Additionally, the direct effects of climate change are expected to be most severe in rapidly developing regions, particularly those currently supporting largely rural populations. Even beyond economic indicators, research shows that the tropics lag in uh, health, education, energy, productivity, technology, uh, and many of these regions still have limited access to reliable and affordable energy services, which is a critical indicator of, of global development. So we're seeing issues with rapid urbanization as well as economic disparity in the tropics uh, as, as major barriers to the sustainable development of urban buildings. But the strategies in this course respond most to globalization, which I think is one of the greatest issues facing sustainable urban architecture. Advances in mechanical technologies and air conditioning market penetration have supported global trends toward um, uh, sealed glazing dominated buildings, regardless of climate, culture, or local identity. In architecture and construction, this phenomenon is evident in the ubiquitous uh, building styles and materials emerging in urban centers across the globe. At the bottom of the slide, you see Toronto on the left uh, and Singapore on the right, both incredibly different climate zones, but very similar building styles. The, the history of the built environment is quite extensive and building technologies have typically evolved slowly over time. Uh, however, the universal adoption of air conditioning, tall buildings and curtain wall technology, all within the span of a single generation have uh, created incredible impacts on the urban skyline as well as on global energy consumption. So when we scaled up to the urban commercial building, we kind of skipped over the age old construction strategies, which developed slowly over time and in response to climate. Uh, the image on the left, for example, is the Indian Jolly screen, which helped to lower the air temperature and improve thermal comfort in naturally ventilated buildings. So the goal of this course is to explore the vernacular strategies associated with rapidly urbanizing tropical regions in order to translate their character, physical qualities, and thermal capabilities to a commercial scale, ultimately reducing the reliance on energy intensive mechanical systems while developing a, a new climate and culture specific urban identity. This course is divided into three parts. In the first, research and translation students will choose a, a region identified by the United Nations as rapidly urbanizing. And they will study both traditional and modern building styles in order to establish a vernacular typology for that particular region. From there, they will study the thermodynamic principles that apply to the identified system within the social and cultural context of their chosen reason, region. Next, we'll move into the advanced fabrication and experimentation phase which will be followed by communication. The goal of this phase is to teach students to communicate complex principles with simple and graphically tangible means. The integration of digital simulation energy modeling instruments in education can empower innovation, certainly. 
Uh, yet these tools, which are becoming increasingly user-friendly, enable an already tech-savvy generation to lean on digital outputs without a solid understanding of the, of the physical metrics. Uh, I've, I've now taught a version of this course for three years, and I've found that hands-on physical testing is the most effective way to learn basic building science phenomena, and research shows that there's a strong correlation between hands-on projects and deep learning. Additionally, these devices are much more affordable and accessible than commercial devices, <clears throat> excuse me, making experimentation accessible and uh, potentially part of the design process, which could lower the barrier to building and closure innovation and democratize material research. Additionally, there are just some things about moisture transfer that are difficult to replicate uh, in the digital realm. The class tries to reinforce the idea that the environment that we live in is a tool to understand the world around us. Uh, for example, during non-COVID years, we spend the first day of class on a thermal scavenger hunt in the building that they take most of their classes in. Uh, studying vernacular is really no different because we can easily understand how our, our own body responds to extreme conditions without the influence of uh, air conditioning or mechanical conditioning technologies. So ultimately, the goals of these projects that they, that they study are to produce measurable data, communicate knowledge by visual means, and react to data and modify accordingly. So I want to share a couple of the projects from the previous iteration of the course, which was not referencing vernacular strategies. Um, instead, they, they chose a topic that they were interested in. So Anna Sandoval and Michelle Barrett from Tulane University explored the desiccating potential of various course materials uh, in order to evaluate their applicability in simple, low-cost passive dehumidification systems at the building facade. Their project was also really interesting because the students had a strong interest in exploring the intersection between building science and, and social justice advocacy. So their intent was to create a process to develop accessible building closure solutions for marginalized communities of the rapidly developing tropics. They built a small insulated chamber that held temperature and humidity sensors, and they conducted two types of experiments. Then they used this data to ask what properties of the materials enhance the desiccating qualities and how can this further be applied to permeable building facades? This was ultimately the question that they were hoping to answer in order to develop facade systems that uh, decouple the provisions of, of cooling from dehumidification. The students in the first project were architecture graduate students with advanced fabrication and representation skills. This project, looking at the effect of uh, materials on urban heat island, was conducted by Hannah Lee, an undergraduate student in environmental studies in the School of Liberal Arts, also at Tulane. She did not have any fabrication skills, but was able to produce a really successful project. The intent of her research was to explore the thermal and emissive properties of exterior materials under both day and night conditions to study the cause of the urban heat island effect. She built a two foot tall foam chamber and suspended a heat lamp overhead to simulate daytime conditions and then turned the lamp off while still recording to simulate nighttime conditions. So for each sample, she had a surface temperature as well as ambient air temperature, uh, which again, she studied in both day and night conditions. And she ran this experiment on a wide range of materials, though she didn't really discover anything novel about the materials uh, or the various samples. She now has a clear understanding of the material impacts on urban heat island. The, these projects are significant, not because of the specific findings, uh, which were either fairly imprecise or quite predictable, you know, published in the literature, uh, but because of the experience gathered while generating these results. Uh, ultimately, nearly all the students found that um, the design of the experimental setup, the apparatus, and the, and the processes were more informative than the data on its own. The projects are also a good example to show in contrast because the difference in construction quality. This proves that a better constructed apparatus does not necessarily lead to better results. Um, and this demonstrates the benefits of quick, low-tech experimental procedures because ultimately, the goal of this work is to use simple experimentation as a tool to translate the inherent material qualities of low-cost everyday materials into innovative building systems. Much of uh, modern building technology research circulates around high-tech complex systems that are just out of reach to students not well versed in the metrics um, and, and can serve as a crutch or even worse, a, a greenwashing tool in the design studio. 
Uh, ultimately, this course is part of a larger body of research um, about democratizing building technology innovations to the occupant and the users of the system. So be sure to check out our course website, www.buildtestbuildtest.com. Uh, and thanks for your attention, and I welcome your questions. Aloha. We are honored to be here to present our course proposal, Just Play, and grateful to the ACSA and Columbia University's Temple Hoeing Buell Center for the Study of American Architecture for the 2021 Course Development Prize. We are a diverse interdisciplinary team of faculty members based at the School of Architecture and Department of Urban and Regional Planning at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Each of the four of us will explore climate and equity topic areas in our planning, landscape architecture, and environmental design courses in which university students will design a game or an educational tool to be used in a NOAA Academy Summer High School course. Our course partners, the University of Hawaii at Manoa, with the recently established City and County of Honolulu Office of Climate Change, Sustainability, and Resiliency, OCCSR, uh, amidst unprecedented climate, economic, and public health challenges. Today, $93,000 or less is considered low income for a family of four on Oahu, matching San Francisco as one of the most expensive housing markets in the country. Honolulu has the highest per capita houselessness rate in the country, tied with New York City. Almost 90% of the island's food supply and 85% of its energy is imported. Doing nothing about climate change will cost Oahu at least $12.9 billion in at-risk coastal real estate and assets. Honolulu is projected to bear 66% of the projected statewide economic loss due to sea level rise. So a resilient Honolulu impacts the well-being of the entire state. In 2019-2020, the Office of Climate Change, Sustainability and Resiliency conducted extensive talk stories with the community in what are known as Kuka Kukas, which will inform our work. Our partnership with the Manoa Academy will provide just play with an existing summer program infrastructure that offers underserved and aspiring high school students a chance to take university courses each summer. The Academy is connected to 12 partner high schools, including Kamahameha schools established to educate Native Hawaiian students. We wanted to build on previous engagement experiences and tools designed for our work with communities and explore similar methodologies for hands-on scenario exercises for high school students. The games taught in the Manoa Academy course will use work developed in multidisciplinary undergraduate and graduate courses taught at UH Manoa. The goal in this first week of the five-week course will be to deepen students' understanding of the land-water-food nexus and its salience in an island ecosystem while placing it within the broader context of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. The game will encourage students to explore different scenarios that address this nexus in supporting community-based economic development, particularly in the face of a changing climate and urban growth. Students will play in teams and participate in facilitated sessions. In developing the game in our graduate course, we will rely on precedents, including student work on a similar theme done in a site planning class, um, the Ka'ala Farm Educational Center. In the second week of the course, students will investigate hydrological resources at the watershed scale. The game in this week will teach students about adapting inherited hydrological infrastructure to emergent climate risks, such as more frequent flash floods, storm surge, and sea level rise. These strategies will be informed by historical methods of inhabiting and cultivating the water's edge, explored in Masters of Landscape Architecture studios. The ultimate hope is that students will learn the value of collaboration and stewardship of these shared landscapes.
At the scale of the Ely or neighborhood, a fourth year design studio will explore issues related to community equity, starting with OCCSR's work to develop a social economic vulnerability index for Oahu, a tool which identifies residents and communities that are most vulnerable to disasters based on key variables. This community equity exercise will explore chronic stresses and acute shocks to community health and equity through the lens of the criminal justice system and incarceration. The intergenerational overrepresentation of Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander people across the criminal justice system reflects inequities tied to systemic poverty, lack of safe housing and employment, mental health conditions, substance abuse, and trauma. Design students will begin to design community assets to address these issues and disparities. Building on a multi-unit university initiative, Ho'okaulike, toward a new justice ecology, my ARC 415 students will develop a community investment scenario-driven game and design community assets to address these issues. The game will explore stakeholder roles and impacts of new programs and facilities across sectors with the overall goal of returning incarcerated individuals to their communities. This module will focus on the design of dwelling at multiple scales. We will depart from ARC 342, a design studio that is currently being piloted with the third year undergraduate students of the BENVD program at the School of Architecture. The studio will be divided into three phases. Phase one focuses on developing an understanding of the multifamily dwelling typology and developing concepts for hybrid housing. Hybrid refers to both mix, mixing housing typologies and combining dwellings with other compatible programs. Phase two centers on the design of a typical holistic housing block. And during phase three, students will explore abstracting ideas, strategies, and tactics to design educational games as toolkits for designing walkable, sustainable, and equitable dwellings. The exercise presents the opportunity of incrementally introducing the complexity of density using something that is familiar to the students, such as a typical 5,000 square foot single family residential lot. How do we overcome skepticism about increased density? What if instead of one family and a single lot, we could fit five, 10, or even 20 households? The studio is leveraging research I developed for the Hawaii Public Housing Authority, which presents 12 design strategies for holistic housing in Hawaii. This report highlights learning from the COVID-19 pandemic. For example, we know the design of buildings and spaces influences the mental and physical well-being of its inhabitants. During the pandemic, exercise became an essential activity. Social distancing fueled the need for physical separation between inhabitants. And balconies, patios, decks, and porches provide a respite from confined quarters. Shouldn't we all have access to the outdoors? What does this teach us about spatial privilege? The study of the block introduces different challenges, such as street frontage, human scale, the need for shared amenities, and open space. The students will use the holistic housing framework to determine which aspects of design impact the livability of the block in the neighborhood. Livability goes beyond the physical well-being, convenience, or ecological balance. Social justice plays a critical role in the health of our communities. What are the design decisions that directly impact social equity and anticipate the challenges of climate change? The studio explores potential sites in transit-oriented zones. This semester, we're focusing on the Kalihi Kapalama neighborhood, which is being reimagined as we anticipate the future rail. Designs are also being explored for the year 2050, taking into account the implications of both current and future challenges. Lastly, the studio will be informed and inspired by a community engagement toolkit previously developed for the Hawaii Public Housing Authority that included sets of cards, an app, and a playful space for interaction inspired by the everyday lawn chair. We will abstract architectural components and explore architectural as artifacts as devices for engagement, decision-making, communication of cause effect, and envisioning alternative scenarios. During the Manoa Academy, students will play or test these games and document their learning opportunities and challenges. Our overall Just Play effort will culminate in our 2022 Just Play Manoa Academy five-week summer course, in which each week explores the scales and topic areas using the games developed in the preceding university courses. Thank you.
I'd like to begin by thanking the ACSA and Columbia University's Temple Hoyne Buell Center for the Study of American Architecture for this award and for the opportunity to present on a class that is currently being taught from a basement office in North Park, San Diego to a group of 19 fifth year BARC students and their homes in Southern California. I'd also like to thank Jose Peral, the chair of the Woodbury San Diego Architecture Program, for his endless support, as well as Heather Flood and Ingalil Walrus Ritter of Woodbury and Burbank, and my current students going on this wild ride with me. To begin, I'd like to provide some information about professional practice at Woodbury. As you know, professional practice courses are often the dumping grounds of NAB accreditation requirements so that other courses can be freed up to do as they wish. Dean Walrus Ritter and others at Woodbury have taken a different approach and chose to realign the school's mission to focus on preparing students to be leaders in the effort to transform the future of architecture practice. As a part of this, the entire professional practice curriculum is being reconsidered and the required professional practice courses were increased from two to three, thus giving us more leeway and freedom in what and how we teach, hence this course. We teach a very diverse group of students at Woodbury and we aim to prepare them to be critical, collaborative, and constructive leaders in the profession. We don't want them to be surprised when they enter a field that doesn't look like them, doesn't value the same things that they do, and does not have the level of agency and autonomy that they experience in architecture school. We would like them to instead be prepared with a toolkit filled with skills that will give them the best chance of not only staying in the field, but thriving and changing it for the better. To explain the context of this course, I will begin with three quotes, none of them from architects, that have informed my current thinking about what our students need to understand about the current and future state of practice. This first one is almost too simple uh, as it defines the challenges that we're all collectively facing. The second is about the intense emotional response that we need to have. She said, I don't want your hope. I don't want you to be hopeful. I want you to panic. I want you to act as you would in a crisis. I want you to act as if our house is on fire because it is. And the third is the foundation of the main assignment for this course and written by the CEO of the largest investment firm in the world. We are facing the ultimate long-term problem there is no denying the direction we're heading. Every government, company, and shareholder must confront climate change. All three quotes are from the last few years, and they were all said in the context of business and economics, not architecture, but of course we know how interrelated these are. This is to say that the great existential problems that we're facing in the practice of architecture are problems that are being faced by all businesses, organizations, and people around the world. This course attempts to take a hard look at the structure of architecture practice by reevaluating the way that architects design and conduct their businesses at a time when all businesses around the world are or should be undergoing the exact same process. Despite how contingent architecture is as a profession, we as architects have long embraced the excuse of what Mar Iris Marion Young called not my job when considering the larger ethical issues around our profession. Slave labor on a job site, not my job. Sand extraction into destroyed vital ecosystems in order to produce your concrete, not my job. Client engaging in questionable business practices, not my job. The climate crisis is an ethical issue and architects are complicit whether or not it says so in our contract. As architects, we work in inherently unequal environments. We're part of a very complex supply chain of goods and services. Architecture is a political act, even if architects have made a point of trying to remain apolitical. And sometimes the right thing to do isn't to build. We will not be able to use technology and design products to get ourselves out of this global disaster. What we need to do is fundamentally rethink our entire extraction-based lifestyle and economic model, and for architecture, extraction-based business models and work products, and propose as many alternatives as possible. For this reason, we must support and make space for diverse, collaborative thinking and to determine how, how to, in fact, embrace it as our job. This course is inspired by the many economists, architects, and thinkers who are critically interrogating our value systems to uncover how these systems have led to the situation we have today. This is an image from an Extinction Rebellion demonstration. We can stop this if we try. But first, we need to understand what this is. Why is infinite growth considered not only good economics, but actually possible? What if we put monetary value on carbon, on deforestation? What if buildings and cities were designed and built for people to live in and not for places for the wealthy to park their money? 
If we change these value systems, how much more would women and minorities and minorities be paid? What kind of innovation would occur and how fast if destroying the environment actually had an effect on the bottom line? And what if less isn't more? And that actually it is just a way for capitalism to extract the most value from our labor in exchange for the smallest amount of compensation and the largest return for the client and investors. What if more is actually more? More investment in better infrastructure, green public spaces, better density, longer lasting buildings. And this total overhaul, this complete interrogation, is important not only because things have changed, but they have completely changed and they've only has happened in the last few decades. And unless we do something in every sector, in every aspect of business and daily life, we are in serious trouble. Our students must know this and they must be ready to act. The house is on fire. This is future practice. Professional Practice 3 challenges the students to explore these lines of thinking by developing an architecture business plan that incorporates environmental and social justice goals in its DNA. Their goals are presented within the framework of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, a globally accepted framework that it recognizes that addressing the climate emergency requires addressing all facets of social and racial inequality and injustice. By using the SDGs, students start to understand the vast, complex, and interrelatedness of the issues and invite architecture into this global conversation. As a part of the business plan, each student picks one environmental justice and one social justice goal that they personally want to better understand and address, identifies the corresponding SDG, provides some larger context for why this is an issue within architecture, and then identifies at least three different ways that this issue can be addressed in their practice. I encourage them not to propose only technical solutions. I'm finding that students are, for the most part, only learning about the climate crisis and architecture's relationship to it in their building technology classes, and it's barely addressed in studio, if at all. Once the environmental and social justice goals and approaches are identified, the students go back and re-engineer an actionable business plan for an architecture firm that is designed to achieve these goals, as well as the kind of work and the kind of work environment that the student would like to have in their practice. Students are finishing up their final business plans now and are coming up with some pretty interesting ideas. They're proposing doing embodied carbon and life cycle assessments on their designs, reusing materials, only using labor and materials within a certain distance of the project site, refusing to use certain materials from the Living Building Institute Red List. They're setting minimums and maximums for the size and type of work that they will do and the type of clients that they will work with. They're looking at project procurement and thinking about how to avoid this race to the bottom. They're thinking about how they want to define their value in architecture and the value that they can provide for a range of clients. Many students are choosing gender equity, SDG 5, for their social justice goal and addressing this issue by aiming to hire an equal number of men and women providing wage transparency and a clear explicit path to promotion, providing equal maternity and paternity leave, and flexible working hours for everyone. For all of these proposals, the potential positive and negative effects of these approaches to their businesses are studied. Will it hurt their bottom line? Will it improve it? Retain workers? Attract or turn away clients? All of these questions need to be answered in the body of their business plan. Like I said, it's early days, but so far I'm heartened by the different perspectives that all of the students are bringing to the assignment. The breadth of approaches and thinking, as well as the sheer variety of the type of work that they'd like to do and how they would like to do it. If the future of architecture practice is even remotely like this, it's very exciting. Finally, I'd like to leave with one last quote in these thoughts. The climate emergency requires all of us to question reverse engineer and dismantle the institutions that have created it. We built these systems of value, these systems of extraction, systems of oppression, and we can be the ones to change them. And more importantly, we can teach our students that they can change them. I believe that this is a very exciting area for future research. I am certainly not an expert and others in our field are way ahead of me. I'm learning as I go and I would like to thank again Temple Hoyne Buell Center for the Study of American Architecture and the ACSA for the resources to do, resources to do so. Thank you. Everybody can hear me as we roll back in? Cool. So we have nine minutes uh, to discuss 
uh, quite an impressive range of really incredible material. I, I said right before the call started, but I want to say again, from the Buell Center's side, um, just like a hearty congratulations. It's really um, exciting uh, to, to see, uh, for us at least, the, the range of material presented, uh, the sort of um, energy and um, different kinds of specificity that are, that are being put on the table. Um, so just since this is our one moment of congratulations, I want to be sure that that is really uh, centered here. Um, the other thing I'll say, so just for everybody in the audience, um, be sure if you have any questions, you can add them to the Q&A, um, and we will get to them here in these eight minutes, fingers crossed. Um, I want to say before, I have a question or two, and obviously if there's anybody um, within the panel who wants to ask a question, feel free. I want to mention too, just so it's not lost for the audience, that there were also honorable mentions this year, as there were last year, um, and I'm just going to name them really quickly. They're listed on the project sites, but we have Living by Water. Um, at Hampton University by Amy Carminis and um, Carmina Sanchez del Valle. We had Spaces of Coal by Pep Aviles from Penn State University, and the Built Environment um, at the University District of Columbia by Hyun K. Ra. So they're also their um, course information is uh, downloadable on the website if you're curious. So um, while we wait, we'll see if anybody any questions come in. My my Curiosity, I mean, I think everybody saw the really, um, like I said, incredible range of material that the, the presentations really, I think, spoke for themselves in terms of all the connections that, that you all are drawing within your courses. Um, it, it, for us, the emphasis from the beginning has been on the sort of Ant Society part of the um, list, you know, the title. As um, Megan said there at the end, um, our experience, at least as we were beginning to conceive of this with the ACSA a few years ago, was as she said that the the you know majority of uh, uh, courses that we were encountering dealing with climate change um, at schools of the built environment came at it through a technical lens at the exclusion of other approaches. Um, and so we were this is one of a few efforts where we were just trying to sort of put some pressure and see if we could stir up knowing that there was really good work out there that wasn't doing that, trying to bring that a little bit more to the fore. Um, and so selfishly, my um, uh, interest, because I think, like I said, the courses, um, because of your, your presentations and the material available online, in many ways speak for themselves in terms of how the content is already interdisciplinary, put, you know, pressing boundaries sort of between like what what's discussed in the studio, you know, professional practice uh, shifting, et cetera, like bringing history into places where it wouldn't otherwise be, bringing engineering in contact with, um, you know, planning. So my question is really is about the sort of the version of that at the institutional level, because part of our interest also uh, is, um, is trying to um, elevate, give visibility to com institutional conversations uh, um, sort of that operate in the same register. In other words, kind of, again, as Megan said, just because it's fresh, I don't know, it wasn't um, her quote, but the sort of that's not my job issue. I mean, the, this has been quite a year or two or three at schools of the built environment, it, well, across the planet, but you know, that has penetrated schools of the built environment. And I think there's a lot of long overdue um, questioning of what it means to be a professional of the built environment that reverberate not just within studios, but across entire schools. So my, my question for you all, or just if anybody wants to jump in, is kind of, you and each of you touched on this in your own way, but it, be, it was a criteria of interest for us for the prize, is sort of the institutional, institutional situating of these courses, what they're doing that's new within the institution that might speak to changes underway there, um, or that you might want to see underway more, you know, uh, um, uh, in earnest. Um, yeah, I don't know. And, and, like, I think some are evident, but I would just be curious if any of you would be willing to jump in and speak a little bit about um, sort of outside the course, what the course um, is is aiming to do, or what changes at the institutional level it's plugged into, because these these um, the changes we're calling for, you know, are reach reach far and deep. So I could pick and choose each of you, because I think there's different ways you're all um, uh, doing that with your institutions. But um, if anybody just wants to jump in to talk about sort of larger changes afoot, maybe, and how, you, how you're plugging in, that'd be great. 
Jacob, let me jump in. I think for us, it was very much a, an attempt to pull together three existing discussions we had, the traditional environmental systems discussion taught by Professor Mosin Nin, a traditional discussion of planning taught by me, and then also go outside and recognize that Florida A&M and other black colleges, Dr. Ellis teaches African-American history, and that course is required. So how do we begin to get architecture students to look uh, outside their box and even these African-American history students to come into architecture conversations and, and very much see the outcomes that we see around us are, are deeply rooted in certain preferences and inequities. And I think, you know, Reggie, Reggie teaches actually these African-American history conversations. Yeah, and I'll, I'll chime in very quickly. Um, so this is something that we, we were already doing just in, a, in, a, in history courses. And so Professor Chen uh, presented this idea to me um, this was a course that I taught, uh, an aspect of a course that I taught about four or five years ago, and the American Historical Association actually acknowledged it um, as a, a, a very impactful course. And we partnered with the city of Tallahassee um, as they were looking at what is now FAMU Way Historic uh, Canal Drive and the revitalization of that. I didn't think uh, back then to even think about reaching out to our school of architecture because it was something that they should have uh, and i know now andrew was already working with them on the other end so for for me it helped break down silos uh to show that one everything has a history um and two that we should be working together across the board um at a university so it, this is a great project for me and I look forward, uh, and I, I joke with Andrew all, all the time and, and, and tell him thank you for welcoming me into the, uh, the faculty of the School of Architecture now. So they, they have a new colleague. Yeah, I can, I can jump in too. Um, for, for my course, it was, uh, it, it's ultimately seeking different sources of inspiration. A lot of what we look at in sustainability research uh, especially in the design studio, is uh, how to optimize our glass, how to shade our glass, uh, because we have so much glass, which is really something that comes from uh, the international style and, and, and modernism, um, which, you know, if you look at, at the, the architects who were doing that work, it's a series of European white men. Um, and what what we're trying to explore is is, you know, styles that are native to regions um, that are kind of adopting this international style, but we should be looking at uh, the stuff that they did that was right, uh, you know, before air conditioning, before the international style, uh, and using that as a source of inspiration. I guess what's exciting for me, just to build on both of those, is the is the possibility that, you know, the, the work you're doing inside the class, just to maybe reiterate what I was saying before, I, it seems inevitable to me that it'll reverberate beyond the, the classroom. In other words, you know, like at, in Florida, the the idea that you're bringing in, you know, a history professor to the studio, I think, you know, architecture in some ways has a long history of sort of a, a certain kind of interdisciplinarity. But I think that um, in a lot of different ways, these courses um, are doing a little bit more of a structural Shaking, like the super studio model, I think is getting pushed. That was also happening in, um, in one of the, I know at least one of the um, honorable mentions in Penn. There's like a, the the ways we're reaching not just across sort of, you know, to, it's like it's not a it's not a, speaking about uh, a little bit of sociology inside the studio, but you're like we have, I think much more sort of generous and hopefully like longer lasting. Um, connections that are getting made, um, which is, it's, that seems really promising to me because only at that level of the superstructural resituating of these, some of these conversations, what it means, you know, what, what is our job as professionals of the built environment um, uh, is, is um, a big, we need to answer that differently. And I think, um, anyway, I, I'm really encouraged um, by you all and the, the, stories that they seem to indicate about change that's afoot at each of your institutions and sort of more broadly um, across our shared disciplines. So it's 12.01. I don't think I saw any Q&As come in. That's good. So there's um, very good that I didn't miss anything. Um, we'll post the video of this um, on, they'll be on this 
the ACSA platform as well as on that Buell Center uh, project website, Power Inf uh, Infrastructure in America. Um, we are available for any and all questions about the prize, um, about the, the interest in the sort of shifting of the profession is something we're exploring in a little bit more depth in that project called Green Reconstruction that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, so I encourage you to, to follow that, but really um, stay in touch. Um, and, and I hope that we have started a, or ACSA is helping support um, an informal network of faculty interested in this topic, which is sort of an all-encompassing topic. So it's basically just going to be a Google group. But the idea is to really try and make this a conversation that can, you know, so faculty can support one another um, in, the, in the years to come, because obviously it's only, it's only going to grow. So um, yeah, thank you again. And I don't know if there's any special way to close off besides saying uh, until next time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Great to meet you all. Thank you. Congrats Thanks. again. Take care. Thanks.